Vice President of the Industrial Minerals Association, and I have here with me Chris Greising, our Vice President for Government Relations. And thank you for joining us today for this webinar on uh, sampling for silica exposures, uh, industrial hygiene issues relative to sampling for silica. Um, we're, we're going to be doing several webinars um, relating to silica. Uh, next week on March 6th, uh, Sandler Occupational Medicine is also going to do a webinar on the medical aspects uh, of silica exposure, and we have one planned later on, I believe in April, on the engineering control. So just watch your emails for, for those upcoming webinars as, as well. Um, today we have Bill Walsh with Galson Laboratories conducting the webinar. Galson is a new associate member that just joined a few weeks ago, and uh, we appreciate them um, giving us time today for, for this webinar and sharing their expertise. Before we get started, just a couple housekeeping issues. Um, everyone except for uh, me and uh, Bill will be muted. And uh, so if you have any questions, you're going to need to type those in, and you can type them in at any time during the webinar, so feel free to do so. And probably towards the end, um, we will read those questions to Bill and, and, and uh, have him answer them. So feel free to type those in, and we encourage you to. Um, and then secondly, after the webinar is over, usually within 24 hours, We'll send out the recording to the webinar that will be synced with the slides. So you will get the slides and you will get the recording after this um, webinar is completed. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Bill Walsh uh, with Galson Laboratories. He's the um, business development manager, um, and he has a very impressive resume I have here in front of me. Um, I'm not going to dare read all of it, but um, he has an MBA. Um, and a BS degree in chemistry. He's also a certified industrial hygienist and a regu registered occupational hygienist in Canada and um, has an extensive background in laboratories and uh, um, consulting services, etc. And uh, we do appreciate Bill uh, joining us today from Chicago. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill. Thank you, Daryl, and thank you, everyone who's on the line. What I wanted to do today was give a, a, an overview of how to sample for silica. Uh, my background is almost all laboratory. I have some, done some field studies, but uh, it's kind of uh, the overview I'm going to present is kind of from a, a chemist standpoint to uh, give you an idea of the uh, limitations and, and advantages of the current procedures. Uh, give you some of the background so that you know why you do what you do rather than just uh, follow the uh, NIOSH or OSHA procedures, and to uh, bring up some of the points of the proposed PEL or the proposed standard to uh, see how things are going to change a little bit. So. Um, the current OSHA standard is based on respirable dust. Dusts are divided into two different categories, total dust, and then a subset of that is respirable dust. Respirable dust is, is basically defined as anything smaller than 10 microns, and I've got a couple other slides that will make that clearer, whereas total dust, as uh, it sounds, is everything that's in the air. Now, a couple things to keep in mind about respirable dust is that it's small, and being small, there are uh, uh, a couple uh, characteristics of it that kind of make it uh, an interesting um, beast. One of them is that oftentimes, if there they, there can be a significant respirable dust exposure, and you won't be able to see it. Uh, just because the particles are so fine. So when you see a truck going down a haul road or something and there's a huge plume behind it because they haven't watered for a while, most of that dust is not respirable. It's going to be, uh, you know, too big. And that dust will settle down reasonably quickly, whereas respirable dust, because it's so small, 
tends to stay airborne for a long time. So uh, those two things make it uh, a more uh, hazardous subset. Sampling for size selective dusts is uh, reasonably new in the field of industrial hygiene. Uh, hygiene. There's always been uh, rust verbal in total, but now there's a couple other categories that are starting to uh, to show up more and more. Uh, inhalable, which is defined as particles basically smaller than 100 microns, and thoracic. Uh, basically with a, a 10 micron 50% cut point. And I should explain that. The 50% the cut point, when you use um, the cyclone, which is the, the sizing mechanism that's used to take these samples, it takes a range of samples. So the 50% cut point is defined as where the sampler is, has a 50% efficiency. So um, basically, for inhalable, it's collecting 50% uh, particles greater than 100 microns and 50% particles less than 100 microns. Uh, thoracic is, you know, a 10 micron cut point and respirable is 4 micron cut point. So you can see each one is smaller. The uh, significance of this is that uh, as the particles go down into the lungs, there's less and less uh, defenses available to the body to protect you from the from the uh, from the particles. So uh, total dust would be you know everything that's deposited. It's it's the whole the whole fraction. Um, uh, thoracic screens out the uh, the respirable fraction, which is the pink, and it's just the, um, you know, the inhalable and thoracic. Now, respirable screens out the, the inhalable and the thoracic, so only particles that are 10 microns or smaller get deposited into the uh, very deep parts of the lung, into the gas blood exchange region. And, you know, if you think about it, um, you have nose hairs, there's hairs along the trachea, and all those things tend to uh, eliminate uh, contamination. So if you, uh, you know, you're in a dusty environment, you, your nose hairs filter out a lot of the, uh, the dust, and then you're, as you're breathing later in the day, you might notice that some grit comes up from your uh, airway just because the cilia are moving it up. But stuff that gets down into the very bottom part of the lungs, there's really no way for it to be eliminated. Uh, that combined with the uh, inert nature of silica make it a particular hazard because once it gets into the bottom of your lungs, there's really no way for your body to get rid of it. And as it builds up over the years, uh, significant scarring occurs, um, which causes uh, silicosis, which is sort of like emphysema. Your lungs lose their elasticity and your ability to, uh, to breathe easy. And there's also uh, some evidence that uh, the deeply embedded particles can, can make you more vulnerable to uh, lung cancer. Here's an example of uh, what 50% cut point means. Um, it's interesting to note that right now OSHA uses a 3.5 micron 50% cut point in the, the current standard uh, back from the 70s. The rest of the world uses a 4 micron cut point just because uh, it was, uh, it's been determined that, you know, the range of, of uh, particles that can be embedded in the lungs is a little bit larger than was originally thought. I mean, here you can see, uh, you know, basically if it's 10 microns, it's not collecting anything. By the time it gets down to 2 microns, 90% of the particles have been collected by the uh, by the cyclone, and in this instance, the 50% cut point is 3.5. If you're using a uh, SKC aluminum cyclone at 2.5 liters per minute, you'd see the same basic type of curve, only it would be moved up a little bit. Uh, Rust 
microbial dust is taken on a, a PVC filter, and there are several different kinds depending on the cyclone you use. So if you uh, are going to use a Dor Oliver cyclone, for example, which is the kind OSHA and, and MSHA use, you would need a two-piece cyclone. If you use our laboratory, we routinely send out the SKC cy uh, aluminum cyclone, you need a three-piece cyclone. Um, MSHA uses the little flying saucer things that come in the individual packages, and I included a picture of, of that also. You have to forgive me, I'm having a little trouble moving the, the slides along. When you do the sampling, uh, this is one of the most important things to remember, is that when you put it in the cyclone, the sampling side goes down. When you look at the, cass the cassettes that have the, the filters mounted in them, except for the flying saucer type, you're going to see a spoke pattern on the bottom, what is the bottom of the cassette. Um, when you do silica sampling, that points up because you're mounting it in the cyclone, and the hose for the pump would, well, actually in this case, the uh, hose for the pump would be attached to the uh, cyclone up in this area, so the air comes from the bottom through the top. If the filter goes in upside down, it's a wasted filter. It's a wasted sample. You won't be able to get anything from that particular sample. These are pictures of the different type of cyclones that are used. Uh, C is the SKC aluminum cyclone. That's kind of the newer model. Uh, B and D are types of cyclones that are used a lot in Europe. And A is uh, a Dora Oliver, one that's used by MSHA. There's actually some technical problems with the Dora Oliver. Uh, because it has nylon, it tends to build up a static charge, which is uh, not good for sampling small particles. The particles will adhere to the side of the cyclone. But uh, because that particular uh, cyclone was specified in the rule, uh, they they have to use it. However, they're perfectly fine with people using the other types of cyclones. And the new Celica uh, proposed standard just defines the type of uh, cyclone that needs to be used according to uh, some ISO criteria rather than defining a particular model. This is just a, a definition of a cyclone. I'm not going to go through it. Um, if Daryl, you know, sends out the presentation, you'll, you'll have this. Um, easiest way to keep it in mind is the uh, very similar to the Dyson vacuum cleaner that uh, you see those commercials. Um, the air enters into the air inlet on an angle. It's spun around up through the cyclone, and um, particles below a certain size are going to go straight up and be impacted onto the filter, whereas larger particles, the air won't be able to hold that particle up, and it will drop down into the grit pot. Uh, the reason that the airflow is so critical is that if you run it too fast, you're going to be able to attract uh, larger particles into the filter. If you run it too slow, uh, you're not going to be able to get the right size, and some of the uh, particles that are of respirable size are going to drop into the grid pot. These are the flow rates that are, are needed for a, a 4 micron 50% cut point. Um, the uh, thing to keep in mind on this is that calibrate, you know, both pre and post sampling. Um, if you use our uh, MSHA sampling kit, we, do, we can do the pre and post 
calibration for you, but the pre and post calibration needed to be within 5% of this uh, flow rate in order to have a valid sample. Here's how the SKC cyclone is calibrated. Uh, one of the big advantages of it is this uh, aluminum sleeve that slips up over the bottom. And then you can either use a dry cal or in this case a rotometer to set your pump to two and a half liters per minute. If you're using a Dora Oliver um, or one of the other cyclones, you would have to use a calibration chamber, which is basically a, a plastic jar that you attach. The, uh, you put the cyclone inside through a, uh, a junction, you attach the hose to it so that you're uh, able to, to uh, measure how much air is flowing into the bottle and then out through the top of the cyclone. So here's a, uh, the kind of the summary of how to do rust per bolt dust sampling. You calibrate the pump at the flow rate depending on the type of cyclone you're using. Uh, you want to sample full shift whenever possible. There's two reasons for this. One is that you have to account for the time that you don't sample. Um, and there's some slides further on that'll, that'll demonstrate that. The other thing is that all, the, all laboratory methods have a certain amount of error associated with them. And the more error that you draw through the filter, it kind of uh, diminishes that error. So if you have a, you know, a analytical error of plus or minus 20%, which is what the method says, uh, silicon analysis is, uh, a 100 liter error sample is going to magnify that error, whereas a, a 960 liter error sample, it will not. It'll be a, a lot smaller effect. Um, you want to make sure the grid pot is on because error follows the path of least resistance. And if you don't have the grid pot firmly on the bottom of the cyclone, the air is going to go up through that instead of through the side slit. And you're not going to sample uh, rust purple dust. You'll get some mixture of total dust. Mount the cyclone in the breathing zone of the employee, which is you know standard OSHA sampling procedures. Um, they have a clip on them. You can either clip them on the collar or uh, you know a pocket or something like that. Record activities, start and stop time. This is like the most important thing I can, you know, emphasize is that uh, doing industrial hygiene sampling involves a lot more than just hanging the pump and walking away. You have to have a, a pretty good record of what the employee is doing during the course of the day um, because something happened. You're basically taking a snapshot of his exposure on a particular day. So if um, something unusual happens, a breakdown or something where he's exposed to a higher amount of silica than he normally would be, you can note that and that'll possibly give you an explanation for an overexposure. Conversely, if, uh, you know, something goes down and he's just kind of standing around, you, you're, you're not really getting a representative sample. So you want to continually, you know, make notes of what he's doing, uh, check the Check the pump to make sure it's operating. The pumps can fail, batteries fail. Uh, if the tubing gets crimped, the uh, pump can stall out. And there's, uh, on the pumps we send out, there's a, a little counter on top that uh, ticks off minutes. So when you go out to check to see what's going on, you might want to take a look at, at the minute counter to see if it corresponds to what's been going on. If you've been sampling for three hours, and you look at the uh, minute counter and it says 180, well, then you're good. If it says, you know, 45, then something's happened. Either, you know, the employee turns the pump off when you're not around, which has happened, or else possibly it's faulted out some way. So you want to make uh, clear, detailed notes when you're doing it. And you also want to include uh, field blanks. A lot of times people, you know, question the, the need for field blanks with a, a gravimetric procedure, which is what uh, the rust probable dust determination part of it is, you really want to include a field blank because you're uh, you're accounting for the uh, you know the difference in the environment between the laboratory 
and the, uh, the job site, and we'll go into that in a little bit. When you're done sampling, or even during sampling, one of the most critical things is don't turn the cyclone upside down until you've taken the sample of the filter out of the uh, out of the cyclone. The reason for that is larger size particles are down in the grit pot. If you turn it upside down, they're going to just fall down the middle of the cyclone and, and end up on the filter. If the uh, you know employee is going into a confined space or something, you have the same sort of situation. Make a note of that in your fill notes so that if uh, samples come back unexpectedly high, that might be part of the reason is that, you know, the cyclone got turned upside down. Um, if you're going to use the cyclones multiple times, you, which is perfectly fine, they're, you know, expensive and they should be, you want to clean them, you know, not aggressively. Just use soap and water. Uh, you know, we used to rinse them out with isopropyl alcohol to help dry them out. An ultrasonic cleaner works well, and uh, you want to be careful not to scratch the uh, the interior of the cyclone, like the curved part. Um, that'll affect the ability of the particles to spin around and become entrapped on the on the filter. Here's a employee that's uh, set up and ready to go, um, do his job and, and be. Uh, monitored for silica. You'll note that uh, in this case, the, uh, the tubing is going up the front up there and the pump's mounted on the front of him. I have a feeling that the reason that this is going on is I, I believe this is uh, some kind of underground miner. He's probably sitting on a piece of equipment so that if he sat down in the cab and the tubing was run up his back, it might very well crimp and the pump will fail. Um, you need to be able to have a pretty good idea of what the different operations are. There are operations where having the pump in front might be more of a hindrance than a help. And you can see that um, there's typically clips, alligator clips that help keep the tubing out of the way. Um, the, the pump itself hangs on a belt in, and the, you know, whether it goes in the, in the back of the, employee or the front of the employee is pretty much a uh, uh, function of a particular operation. Now, you may be wondering why I've talked about uh, dust sampling and what you're actually sampling for is silica, and that's the function of uh, the current uh, silica standard. Silica sampling is basically respirable dust sampling, and you're looking for a subset of the uh, respirable dust that's collected on the on the filter. Silica sampling, um, when you see silica, there's two major forms of, of, of silica, two classifications, amorphous, which is just means without form, and um, you know, uh, glass dust could be is a is a form of uh, amorphous silica, and crystalline is where the uh, the silica the quartz are, are, has, has formed crystals in the mine, in, in the earth as uh, things cooled off. And uh, that's the type of, uh, of silica that's of concern occupationally. Um, there are three forms of, of crystalline silica that uh, OSHA is concerned with or MSHA is concerned with, quartz, cristobalite, and tritomite. Uh, basically, quartz is by far the most common form. If you think of sand, you know, it's basically quartz. Uh, quartz, subjected to uh, pressure and heat, kind of morphs into the second form, cristobalite, which would morph into the third form, tritomite, with even more uh, heat and pressure. You'll run into quartz, you know, 90% of the time. If you have a foundry operation or in particular uh, uh, ore bodies, you might find cristobalite. Uh, tritomite, you know, I've been an industrial hygienist for 30 years, and, and the only time I saw it was in, in some uh, dust samples that were collected after Mount St. Helens blew up. 
uh, in the late 80s, uh, there was some tritomite that we saw on there. The uh, The way the standard is, is is written right now, quartz is considered the, the base form. Gustobline tritomite are considered twice as hazardous as, as quartz. In the new proposed standard, there is no distinction between the different forms as far as toxicity is concerned. And the proposed PEL of um, 0 0.05 milligrams per cubic meter is a total quartz number. You'll see how the current one is. Uh, calculated in a few minutes. So, uh, crystalline silica sample is based on a portion of the respirable dust. So, you know, you just go through the basic uh, sampling procedures I reviewed uh, in the first part of the presentation, use it, the cyclone, full shift sample if possible. Generally, overloading is not a concern because you're filtering out so much or screening out so much of the particle. Um, I have seen respirable dust samples come back where they're, they're fairly overloaded, and it does affect uh, the silica analysis in particular, but uh, there are ways around it. And typically, you know, if you have an overloaded filter, you're going to be over the, the respirable dust PEL anyway. And again, make sure you take good peel notes while you're doing it. Crystalline silica analysis is a two-step process um, under the current PEL. First, you do the gravimetric weighing to, to determine how much respirable dust was collected on the filter. And then you do x-ray diffraction or IR. Uh, Galson uses x-ray diffraction predominantly to measure how much of the total respirable dust mass is actually crystalline silica. Now, a couple of problems with this approach that uh, the new proposed standard takes care of, it, one, um, all analytical methods have a certain amount of error, as, you know, I mentioned before. So in a two-step process, you have the error that's introduced by the weighing and then the error that's introduced by the uh, x-ray diffraction. And then the second problem is that every laboratory method is only, sensi only so sensitive. So, you know, one thing you learn when you're becoming a chemist is that there's no such thing as zero. Um, you can measure down to a certain amount, um, for example, uh, quartz, we can measure down to five micrograms. It doesn't mean there's, if we get down to the bottom, we don't see anything. It doesn't mean there's no quartz. It means there's less than we can accurately see. In this particular case, the, uh, the x-ray is a much more sensitive uh, method than the gravimetric procedure is by about a factor of 10. And that can cause some interesting problems that I'll highlight in a minute. This is just a picture of a, a microbalance that's uh, used to weigh stuff. It's, it's accurate down to about 10 micrograms. So, I mean, what we're talking about here is, you know, to put it in a, in a uh, maybe a more easily grasped uh, example is you're looking for 10 people out of a million. So, you know, if I'm in Chicago and there's roughly 7 million people in the metro area, I'm looking for 70 people out of those 7 million. Um, the a summary of the, the method, uh, filters have to be conditioned at a standard temperature and humidity. And this is really important because um, you're, you're weighing such small amounts, the amount of water that's actually on the filter becomes a huge consideration. Even though uh, PVC, which is what the filters are made of, is uh, hydrophobic, doesn't like water, there's going to be a certain small amount there. And you can really see the difference uh, 
this time of year, for example, outside my office here, it's about one degree. So the air outside is incredibly dry. It's been dry for a while. If I was to take a sample that, uh, a silica sample today, and I took a, a condition filter out onto a pump and started drawing air through it, I'd actually be, you know, desiccating the filter. I'd be drawing moisture away from it. Conversely, you know, in Chicago in July, there's probably going to be about 80% humidity outside. And if I took the same sample, I would be introducing moisture onto the filter. The way that's uh, contra contracted in the laboratory is to allow the filters to condition at the same temperature and humidity that they were originally uh, weighed at. And, you know, that works for the for the most part, but it, it, there is a lot of variation uh, back and forth, which is why our detection limit at Galson for uh, PVC filters is 50 micrograms. Uh, that means that we can, you know, accurately measure 50 micrograms consistently. Silica is analyzed by X-ray diffraction, and I'll explain what that is in a minute. But uh, this is a picture of the instrument. And if you look inside, uh, there's an auto sampler here where the samples go. And then what you're seeing is a tower where the X-ray beam is generated, and then an arm that rotates up through an angle. Uh, diffraction analysis is is based on you know exactly what it sounds like. Just as if you stick an ore or your hand or something in water and it looks like the ore is broken uh, or you know on an angle when it hits the water, it's the same thing that happens with uh, with the X-ray beam. The uh, X-ray comes off the generator, bounces off the face of the filter, and then each time it hits a crystal each crystal is going to, to bend that x-ray a certain angle. Then on this part of the, um, over to the right, there'll be a, a, a detector, a simulation counter, that swings up through an arc of angles. And we know what the specific angles that quartz or crystobalite should bend the x-ray beam at, and you detect the amount of x-rays that are found at those angles. Um, since amorphous silica doesn't have a crystalline structure, it doesn't diffract the x-ray at all, and it just goes through. Now, a couple problems here is that there are quite a few um, compounds that will bend x-rays the same angle as uh, quartz. And if there's too much material on the filter, you can uh, start to lose sensitivity, and that will suppress the amount of x-rays that are, that are uh, detected on the other side. The way around that is, is, first of all, to take good notes and let the laboratory know what it is in the area that uh, you're using. For example, uh, we do work in uh, steel mills, and they use graphite in the steel mills. Um, if, this, if the, you know, we see the filters are black, so that's a big hint. but. If the uh, industrial hygienist from the steel mills puts in their, their field notes or writes on the chain of custody, graphite present, there's um, treatment, pretreatments we can do to get rid of that particular uh, interference. If there's too much material on the filter, that's typically uh, recognized by using internal standards where we measure the uh, x-ray uh, diffraction of a, of a known compound, and that tells us if that's within a certain acceptable range, then we know we're okay. If that's suppressed, then we might have to take a, a portion of the uh, material that's on the filter and use the uh, dilution factor to do the analysis. So here's a picture of what the uh, machine spits out. Um, there are several uh, Quartz peaks. There's a. This is the secondary peak. This is the primary peak. So one way we check for interferences is the ratio of these peaks. 
if they're within the right ratio, then we use the uh, uh, primary quartz peak. But a lot of interferences happen at the primary quartz peak, and if that's too large in relation to the secondary peak, then we're, we will quantitate on the secondary quartz peak instead of the primary, which causes a loss of sensitivity because you can see that, you know, one's about a quarter of the sensitivity of the other. And then what you're measuring is the, uh, the peak area under each of those. And it's proportional to the amount of quartz that's there. So the larger the peak area, the more quartz. Okay, now interpreting results. This is where easily within the, the years that I've been an industrial hygienist, the single question that I've been asked more is, what did, what did my silica results mean? Because what you're measuring when you do silica sampling for OSHA or MSHA compliance right now, you're not actually measuring silica content at all. What you're measuring is respirable dust, and then you're adjusting the permissible exposure limit by the percentage of quartz that's present in the area. So, for example, uh, BACGIH just uses a, a, a straight 0.025 milligram per cubic meter um, threshold limit value, which is defined as the amount of silica you can be exposed to eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. Um, Canada uses uh, this procedure. It uses, it uses 0.05 instead of 0.025. It uses one of the older uh, TLVs. But OSHA, the uh, general industry standard is based on adjusting the, the respirable dust, PEL, based on the percentage of silica using this formula. So basically, if you plugged all your numbers in and you had no silica at all, you would end up with 10 divided by 2 or 5 milligrams per cubic meter, which is the OSHA PEL for respirable dust. Uh, conversely, if you had 100% quartz, we'll say, and you put 100 plus 2 and, div and divided 10 by 102, you're going to come out with, you'll actually come out with 0 0.09 something, but basically 0 0.01 or 100 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, so you can see the proposed PEL is reducing um, permissible exposures by half. Um, and then it also has um, adjustments for the amount of cristobalite, the amount of tritomite that's there. And you can see this additional two that's in front of, of those uh, components basically means that they're considered to be twice as hazardous as quartz. Well, in, in the new proposed PEL, it'll be measured just as the uh, ECGIH TLV is. You won't take into account the respirable dust uh, fraction at all. So the two things it does is it gets rid of this hor horrible formula so you don't have a floating PEL. And the other thing it does is it gets rid of the problem with uh, first doing one analysis where you have a detection limit of 50 micrograms followed by a second analysis where you have a detection limit of 5 micrograms. So the end result of it is going to be a report that's easier to understand and uh, a more accurate and precise measurement. Here's an example of the current PEL. Um, sampling time of 480 minutes. Uh, the sample volume ends up being um, 1,200 liters, 1 1.2 cubic meters. The mass of respirable dust found was 855 micrograms. So the dust concentration is 0.71 milligrams per cubic meter. Now, if you look on the bottom, maybe this particular sample was taken on a, in a foundry or something. We found some quartz, we found some cristobalite, we didn't find any tritomite. So we, we ended up having 5.2% quartz and 2.3% cristobalite. That gets plugged into the formula and you end up with the uh, permissible exposure limit of 0.85, oh, I've got it backwards, milligrams per cubic meter. And since your measured amount of 0.71 is less than the PEL, you're under the uh, you're under the PEL for that sample. However, you know, um, action levels would 
come into play where if you're above 0.5 or 50 percent of the PEL, that means that statistically there are times when you may exceed it. That's because what you're taking is a snapshot um, of a person's exposure at that particular day. And over the course of time, there's going to be a lot of variation. So OSHA makes the assumption that you're measuring at the midpoint of his probable exposures. And 50% of the time, his exposures are going to be below that. 50% of the time, his exposures are going to be above that. So there is a, a per percentage of exposures that are going to be over the PEL. Here's an example of a OSHA format report from uh, Galson. I apologize, it's a little hard to read. But if you look at the last, last column, you see uh, this number varies quite a bit. Uh, for the first sample, the permissible exposure limit is 2.6 milligrams per cubic meter because there was 1.9% quartz in the, in the sample. But his respirable dust for sample number one is 1.5 milligrams per cubic meter. It's less than 2.6, so they're fine. Down here, we have three non-detects. So you can see that the permissible exposure limit for those samples is the same as uh, respirable dust, PEL of, of 5 milligrams per cubic meter. But notice what happens to the second sample. Uh, and this is because of the, well, this is an older report. Uh, our detection limit used to be 100 micrograms. But you can see we didn't detect any respirable dust. We did detect some silica. And that causes kind of uh, nasty numbers. You know, if that happens to you um, under the current, current situation, the best bet is to call a lab. You know, we can walk you through it. Um, there was 1.2 percent, actually there was 100 percent silica, which is what causes the problem. And you can see um, 100 percent silica, if you plug that into the formula, comes, into, comes out to the 0.1 milligram per cubic meter PEL, which is right where you're at right now. So this sample doesn't really tell you anything. MSHA uses a slightly different format. Um, probably most of you are, are MSHA regulated. They use an error factor of 20%, which is the uh, standard analytical error for the uh, OSHA ID 142. Um, that's, OSHA considers the method to be plus or minus 20% accurate. Galson runs a little better than that for, for quartz. We're about 11%, plus or minus 11% which is pretty good for, for silica. Uh, it, can be, it can be a problematic analysis just because it's so inert. But in this case, you have uh, a shift-weighted average. Um, MSHA converts all their samples to a 480-minute exposure. Um, the calculated TLV using the same formula OSHA uses is 2.6. So you can see you're below that. Then MSHA goes another step, and they multiply the, the TLB by this 20% error factor, which gives you kind of a citation error of uh, 3.1. So that tells you, what, what that means is that MSHA will not cite unless your exposure level is above this adjusted um, TLV. So in this case, you can see your 41%, uh, the uh, second to last column, is the percent of, the, uh, TL of their adjusted TLV. So you're at 41% and you're below it. Um, down here on the bottom, you can see an example of one that's above. The uh, measured exposure was 7.4 milligrams per cubic meter. The, the base TLV was 5. So there's no, no silica found in that sample. They adjusted the uh, respirable dust, PEL in this case, by 20%. And their citation level becomes 6 milligrams per cubic meter. And you're 120% of that. So you're above citation level. And, and uh, MSHA would cite you not for silica, but for respirable dust. 
So what happens if it's not a full shift sample? Well, there's a formula there. Uh, if you say you take one sample in the morning, one sample in the afternoon, you use those two uh, things together. So uh, you take the, the first concentration in milligrams per cubic meter times the time you took the sample, uh, say it was four hours, so 240 minutes. Then the, the second uh, afternoon sample times uh, another 240 minutes, suppose another four hours. And that will give you the, the time weighted average. Now, there are a couple other possibilities. One, you did that and you end up with the number of samples that add up to a full shift and you use that formula and you calculate your TLB. Um, the other possibility would be uh, say the employee was um, out in the workplace exposed to silica for the morning and then the afternoon he went in the office and did paperwork so there's no exposure at all. If you can document that in the field notes then basically you have uh, a morning concentration times the four hour exposure and then zero for the afternoon so you would have the concentration times 240 divided by a full shift of 480 minutes so the, the number that you get back from the laboratory is actually twice what the, the employee's time weighted average would be. The other assumption you would be say you took samples in the morning um, and then for some reason you got called away on an emergency or something you had to stop sampling but the employee was basically doing the same thing all day. You can if in your professional judgment and through your documented notes you can say that it was a constant exposure then whatever you measured in the morning could be applied for the full shift as long as you have the documentation to uh, to account for that. On the uh, OSHA website, they have a, what they call a, an e-tool uh, that you can use to calculate multiple samples, um, up to 10. So say over the course of an eight-hour shift, you took 10 samples that represent one employee's exposure, you could plug all those numbers in. You would have to change the uh, the sampling rate because OSHA uses the default of 1.7 since they're using a, a door Oliver. You can see I changed mine to 2.5 liters per minute since I was using the SKC aluminum cyclone. You plug it all in and it calculates out and it tells you what your exposure was, um, 0.85 milligrams per cubic meter. And then you look and uh, Your measured exposure is 0.71, your calculated PEL is 0.85, so you're at 54% of the, actually you're at 84% of the PEL. And you can see these lower confidence levels and upper confidence levels, which are these two, um, the last two columns. So your true number is going to be somewhere between 54% and 114%. And that's what I meant by, uh, you know, the uh, statistical probability of having an overexposure. So in this case, basically, if you come out with a, a severity of exposure of, of less than 0.5, then you don't have to worry. Statistically, you'll probably always be below the uh, PEL. If you're above 0.5, then you probably should do some additional sampling or, you know, if there's some easy uh, work change or something you can do to lower the exposure, maybe do that and then measure again. Um, that's going to be written into the new standard, I think. Right now they're proposing a, a, an actual level of 50%, which is 0 0.025, which is the current TLV. That was a lot of uh, stuff thrown at you in a short amount of time, so if you have any questions, be glad to hear them. Okay, Bill, thank you. I was having a hard time getting the phone. Sorry about that. Um, we do have a few questions for you. And uh, again, thank you for your presentation. The, the first question is, 
why are there different flow rate rates for different types of cyclones? Where do these numbers come from? Is that similar to the rate someone breathes? No, it's it's based on the design of the cyclone. They have a um, a curve, so you know basically it starts at zero. If there's no air drawn through the cyclone, it's not going to collect anything. And as you increase the flow rate through the cyclone, it's going to collect larger and larger particles onto the filter. So you want to find the flow rate that um, entraps the target compound, in this case, everything smaller than 10 microns, and that's your critical flow rate. And then that changes between cyclones just because of the design of the cyclone, the length of the, of the equipment and the size of the slot and aerodynamic characteristics of the material. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Um, if anybody else has, has other questions as well, go ahead and uh, type those in. Um, the next question is, does the total dust include what is in the grit pot, or is what is deposited, or is it what is deposited on the filter? I thought only less than 10 micron particles got deposited on the filter. That's, that's exactly right. The stuff in the grit pot doesn't get counted unless you happen to turn the cyclone upside down, and then that's bad. Um, otherwise, stuff smaller than 10 microns is collected on the filter, stuff larger than 10 microns falls into the grid pot and it gets tossed. Okay, and uh, another question is, um, just to clarify, what are the current permissible silica limit and what are the proposed limit? The easier way to say that, the current proposed limit is 0 0.05 milligrams per cubic meter of all forms of silica. The current limit adjusts the respirable dust PEL based on how much silica is present. So it varies from 0.1 if it's 100% silica down to uh, or up to 5 milligrams per cubic meter if there's no silica present. No silica defined as less than 1%. So that's why when you look at that OSHA format report, you see the PEL go up and down. What they're doing is adjusting the respirable dust PEL based on how much silica is present. So the maximum um, or the, the most severe uh, limit is 0.1, and that's going down to 0 0.05 according to the proposed standard. So they're cutting it in half. Okay. And on the, um, one more question, on your MSHA example of the analysis report, you say you were analyzing for silica, do you mean crystalline silica or crystallite? It's uh, crystalline silica. We scan for all three. We quantitate, Gaussian quantitates based on, on uh, quartz, and then we'll let the employee, or the, the uh, the industrial hygienist or the person who submits the report know if we see the other two forms, at which time they can make the decision if they want things adjusted or not, depending on you know, what's there. Okay, and I don't see any more questions. Um, we'll, we'll close out the webinar. Bill, we greatly appreciate it. It was very informative, and I hope it gave everybody some good basic information. Um, and uh, Bill, do you all have your, I assume you have your contact information on the slides. Do you yes. want to give your email address or anything? It's, it's on this particular slide that's up there right now. Okay. Uh, if Galton can be of any assistance in helping you do your, your uh, silica sampling, I'd be happy to help you. Okay, well thanks a lot. And uh, again, everybody will have another webinar next week on March 6th. Um, and I sent out a notice of that um, during this webinar, um, and it, it will involve more of the medical issues surrounding silica exposure by Dr. Howard Sandler with Sandler Occupational Medicine. So we hope you can attend, and uh, with that, I hope everybody has a good afternoon. Thank you.